Well, now, there are two types of difficulty in studying Scripture. One is mental, when you don't understand what you're reading, and one is moral, when you do understand what you're reading. <laughs> And more people have moral difficulties than mental difficulties. Somebody said, the real problems I have are when I do understand what Scripture is saying. Just as uh, in another context, uh, I, I want to write a little booklet sometime on the problems of answered prayer. Because there are so many books on the problems of unanswered prayer, but my problems begin when God answers. And an answered prayer is not a prayer that gets a result, but a prayer that gets a reply which is rather different. Well, now, James is most likely to raise moral difficulties with you than mental. In fact, it's only too easy to understand. That's the problem with James. You may wonder what on earth I can talk about for an hour and 20 minutes on James, but there is a whole lot to say about him. We will not be judged for what we don't know. That is absolutely clear in Scripture. And this old chestnut of a question, what about those who've never heard? Have you heard that question? Anybody who asks me, I say, why? Do you want to be a missionary? Do you want to go and tell them? And I find that nobody who asks that is concerned about them not hearing. They're just trying to create problems, intellectual difficulties. So James, I find a frightening book. Because when you've read it, you can't plead ignorance. And you know that he's concerned with practical Christianity. And your first impressions of the book when you read it are first how practical this book is. It's really down to earth. No nonsense Christianity, where the rubber hits the road, as we say. It's religion for daily life. It's this terribly realistic. Not much doctrinal stuff in it, but an awful lot on behavior. Not much on belief but behavior is a vital dimension to Christianity. I just happened to glance along my bookshelves. Dare I mention books in the presence of my wife? I have three tons of books, <laughs> according to the furniture removal men. But um, I, looked, I looked along my shelves for the books on James, and I just noted the titles of the commentaries, and I found them intriguing. Here they are, Truth in Action, Faith that works, behavior of belief, belief that behaves, make your faith work. They're all utterly practical titles. And if you want the key word of James, it's a very simple little word of two letters. Do. Do. Actually, if you go through the Bible and underline the word do, it's a key word to the whole Bible. And you will be astonished how often it happens, how often it occurs. Unfortunately, we tend to overlook the little words. We underline justification and sanctification, but you underline the word do and you will be astonished. Do you remember that short parable in Matthew about the father who had two sons? He said, go and work in my vineyard. And one said no and he went and the other said yes and he didn't. And then Jesus said, which of the two did? the Father's will. <coughs> Not which of the two professed, but which the two did. And in James we have this challenge to be doers of the word and not just video audiences of it. See? So, do is the key word. The other impression you get is how illogical the book is. I nearly said something could be quite offensive there, but actually this is a far more popular book with the ladies than the gentlemen, uh, for that reason. Uh, it's a string of pearls. <laughs> no, men are so analytical, you know. And I've tried to make a diagram of James and I've failed totally. I've tried to get a structured outline. I can't. He wanders around from one subject to another. But it's so practical. Ladies love this. Men would much, much rather get their teeth into Galatians or something. But uh, it's the ladies who are practical and bring you down to earth with a nice big bump. I remember seeing a lovely little sketch uh, done by a husband and wife couple who are a professional actor and actress. And they came to Guildford once and gave us a fascinating evening of sketches. Maybe one or two of you remember them. And one sketch was the, the curtains went back and here was the man lying on a camp bed 
uh, asleep. And he suddenly woke up and said, I've had a dream, I've had a vision. And he said, I, I saw a ladder stretching up to heaven and angels. And, he's, and he rushed off stage to tell everybody about this vision. And then his wife walked on and looked at the camp bed and said, have you ever noticed that people who have visions never make their beds? <laughs> <Yeah>? And <laughs> I'm quite sure that... <laughs> I'm quite sure that every wife identified with this, you know? And so James is very popular with the ladies, not so much because it's illogical, but because it's practical. But uh, it is illogical. He, he starts a subject, then he leaves it, then he comes back to it later. I describe it like pearls of wisdom that haven't been strung. Very difficult to see the string, but each little thought is such a pearl. But he, he has about five major themes, but he keeps wandering around them all. And so you can't analyze it. Well, sometimes I suppose the Lord is saying, don't analyze my word, just do it. And don't get it all into neat structures. There's little order, not much connection, and it's not systematic. But nevertheless, put these two impressions together. How practical and how illogical, and what does that remind you of? Book of Proverbs. It does exactly the same thing, and on much the same subjects. And so here we have an example of wisdom. Wisdom. Someone sharing practical wisdom. And the wisdom books do this. They jump around. They're not logical. They, they just share bits of wisdom. And if you ever talk to a wise old person, they will just pour out gems to you, not in any particular order, but you just listen and you pick up gems of wisdom from them, from their experience over the years. This is what is happening. So it reminds you of the book of Proverbs and generally what we call Jewish wisdom literature. And in fact, the rabbis have different forms of preaching, but there's one form of preaching the rabbis called charaz. And that means to muse aloud, not to have a kind of prepared address to give, but just to sit in the synagogue with a bunch of Jew Jewish young men around you and an elderly rabbi just share gems and pearls of wisdom with them. It's called charas. And James clearly had sat under such a rabbi in, when he was a young man because he's a master at it. And he's just doing the same thing for us. So let's sit at his feet and learn. Once again, I remind you that the scriptures will not make you clever, but they will make you wise. That's why the scriptures can be understood by uneducated. Amazing how education doesn't open up the Bible to you. The simplest person filled with the Holy Spirit will understand the wisdom of the Bible because they may not be clever enough to play around with it like the biblical scholars do, but an awful lot of biblical scholars finish up as dry as dry. We used to say of one of our professors at Cambridge, he, he dived deeper into the truth and came up drier than anybody else would ever heard. <laughs> and you see, the Bible is for ordinary folk, it's written in Cockney Greek, and it's for people who want to be wise. You can be wise without being educated. Now then, there are five people called James in the New Testament. We've got to ask which one it is. <clears throat> There's the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. There's the son of Alphaeus, the father of Judas, not the Iscariot, the other Judas. There were two Judases in Jesus' twelve apostles. We heard about the other one this morning in worship. There's James the Little. There's the first James martyred by Herod. So which one is this? And the answer comes very clearly. It's James the half-brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus had four brothers and, and a number of sisters. We don't know how many. But he had four brothers. And it's a very interesting study, J Jesus' family circle. I told you that five out of the twelve apostles and possibly seven were Jesus' cousins. That, of course, is why they were at the wedding at Cana of Galilee. I mean, it'd be awful for Jesus to be invited and turn up with all his disciples. It's clearly they were relatives, and that's why a number of them were invited to the wedding with Jesus at Cana. So Jesus found quite a number of his apostles, 
from his wider family circle, but his immediate family circle didn't know what to make of him. I mean, when you've lived with someone for 30 years and then suddenly they go around saying they're the Messiah, it's not easy, is it? And uh, it must have been a real strain for them. Jesus' father, Joseph, we presume was dead. He was the strong, silent type. We haven't a single word from his lips in the Bible. Now, I presume he did talk sometimes, but uh, he's presented to us as a strong, silent figure in Scripture. And yet he must have been a wonderful man for Jesus to call God Abba, Daddy. You know, he must really have had a good experience in his family circle for that. When you consider that half the children, over half now, in inner London do not have a daddy, how will they ever call God Father? But we're presuming that Joseph was dead because he just doesn't appear uh, in the story of Jesus' public ministry at all. Mary and his brothers and sisters do. But there was one stage where the whole family, including Mary, thought he'd gone crazy and was schizophrenic. They didn't use that word. They used to say he was beside himself, that he was living two kind of lives. He was a carpenter who thought he was God. He was beside himself. He was split mind. And it says the family came to take him home and lock him away because they thought he was beside himself. And uh, when they got there, there was too big a crowd, so they sent a message through to Jesus, your mother and brothers and sisters have come to take you home. And he said, my mother, who is my mother? My brothers and sisters, who are my brothers and sisters? He said, anybody who does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother, my brother and my sister. Well, they thought he'd gone crazy, didn't know his own family now. And it must have hurt Mary considerably that from the beginning of his public ministry, he kind of disowned Mary. Didn't call her mother anymore, called her woman. Woman, what have I to do with you? was his first recorded comment to Mary at the wedding in Cana. And who is my mother? Whoever does the will of my father is my mother. And you find that progressively Jesus dissociated himself from his mother until the big break came at the cross where he said, John, that's your mother, that's your son. And as it were, replaced himself in her relationships and Apart from her joining in the prayer before the day of Pentecost, that's the end of Mary. Never hear her name again. She had played her role and it was now over. A remarkable woman, very remarkable. And I'm happy to call her blessed because she prophesied that all generations would call her blessed. I'm not prepared to call her a virgin because she had other children. And she had four boys and a number of girls. And the boys used to tease Jesus even after he began his public ministry. They said, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Why don't you go up and proclaim yourself Messiah? Go on. It's the right time. Be crowds there. Because every Jew expects the Messiah at the time of Tabernacles. And Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Not in December, but September, October, as Luke's Gospel tells us. And uh, I wish we celebrated his birth at the right time and much cheaper in September and October. <clears throat> That's another story. But out of those brothers, two became writers of the New Testament, Jude and James. And it's said that when Jesus died on the cross, his brother James was so deeply upset and full of regret about what he'd said about him and how he'd teased him that he said he would never eat food again and he started to fast on the day Jesus died. And he'd have fasted till he died, except that three days later his brother came back to him and appeared to James. Quite a story, isn't it? And from then on, James called himself a bond slave of Jesus. And these two brothers, when they did write part of the New Testament later after they'd become apostles for Jesus, they never took advantage of their relationship to Jesus. They never said, I'm the brother of Jesus. Jude actually says, I'm the brother of you-know-who. <laughs> and calls himself the bond slave of Jesus. So his own brothers finally were persuaded by the resurrection that Jesus, who'd lived with them in the carpenter's cottage in Nazareth, was none other than the Son of God. 
Amazing, isn't it? That his cousins followed him and that his immediate family believed in him. That tells you something of the quality of Jesus' character. So it's this James, having teased him, came to believe in him, speaks now with reverence, humility and faith and calls his brother God. So James is in that little prayer group with his mother, Mary, waiting for Pentecost, which means that Mary spoke in tongues, doesn't it? They all did and she was there. And uh, that was the second time the Holy Ghost came on her. First time to make her pregnant, the second time to fill her with tongues. But thereafter she takes her place in the congregation as an ordinary member of the church. What humility. Pity we've made too much of her since because that's made many of us frightened of making enough about her and we ought to get it in balance. Blessed Mary. Now, Acts 15 reveals James in a unique capacity. We next see him as the presiding elder of the fellowship in Jerusalem. That's a responsible position. He wasn't one of the twelve, and yet clearly by unanimous consent he was recognized as the leader of the mother church of Christianity in Jerusalem. And he found himself facing a, a most difficult and delicate crisis, the, the biggest crisis in the early church's life, and that whole question of circumcision, which we looked at in Galatians, and the question whether Christianity was going to remain a Jewish sect or whether it would become a universal religion. And James presided over that meeting which could have split the church right down the middle and a split that could have lasted until today. And James saved it. And he did it by appealing to two things, not to his own authority. He appealed to the Spirit and the Scripture together. And Peter told what the Spirit had done with Cornelius and his household. And then James said, well, that ties in with what the Scripture says. Now, there's a beautiful precedent for us. If there's one thing I live and long to see, it is to see people who understand the Spirit and people who know the Scripture get together. Because we're in danger at the moment of diverging. And uh, I've been part uh, from the beginning almost, as you know, of the charismatic renewal in this country. But my greatest concern is that, is that it's drifting away from its scriptural bearings. I have an equal concern for those who know the scripture inside out but don't know the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. And my next, my next book coming out next March is on, it's called Fourth Wave how evangelicals and charismatics can get it together. <laughs> and uh, I'm so burdened for that. And James got it together. He said the Spirit is clearly telling us that he wants Gentiles to be Gentiles and the Scripture says the same. So he said my judgment is this. And everybody agreed. And what could have been a, a catastrophe turned into a beautiful uniting moment under this James, so he was a wise man, very wise, practical man. Church needs practical men who are concerned with making beds as well as having visions. Well now, after that council, a letter was sent out to the Gentile believers everywhere. And that letter said, Gentiles were not laying on you any burden from the law of Moses. But we do ask you, when you're in a fellowship with Jews, just to remember that they have scruples that you need to observe. Scruples about food and so on. Well now, uh, meat with the blood out of it and the rest of it. What it's saying is this, exactly what Paul said in Romans, that when two Christians meet and one feels free to do something but the other has a conscience about it, who gives way? Who adapts to the other? The answer is, in Christian love, the man who feels free to do something doesn't do it. Because it's the person who has most scruples who has the weaker conscience. 
you see? The more you mature in the Christian faith, the freer you are from scruples. Do you know what I mean by scruples? Things that give you a bad conscience. Because most of us get scruples from the way we were brought up. And we feel guilty about doing something because we were told as a child it's wrong. And I was taught as a child that uh, we shouldn't ride bicycles or use cameras on Sunday. Well, now, it was years before I found that Hezekiah 3.16 didn't mention, <laughs> didn't mention cameras and didn't mention bicycles. But when I worked on the farm, I had, to cycle, I had to cycle five miles to get to church. And it was such a strange position, feeling guilty, cycling to worship God. Now I'm free of that, you see. And as you grow up in, the, in Christ, you feel more and more free to enjoy things that God has freely given you. When you come to Christ, having abused those things, you rightly keep off them and you have conscience about them. Do you <coughs> hear what I'm saying? And then, when you get into fellowship with those who've got a conscience about something, if you really love them, then you don't make them hurt by doing something that you feel free to do, but they don't. And that's the important significance of the letter that went out from Jerusalem to the Gentile believers scattered around the Mediterranean who were having fellowship with Jewish believers. So if I'm with a Jew, I go kosher in my food. Paul did the same. To the Jews I become as a Jew, to the Gentiles I become as a Gentile, if by any means I can save some. We need to be adaptable and sensitive to other people's conscience and not flaunt our own freedom. Now then, that letter went out from Jerusalem, from James, to the Gentile believers, but he wrote another letter to go to the Jewish believers. And this is the letter we have. And it's a letter telling the Jews how to behave in the Gentile world which almost corresponds exactly with that letter in Acts 15 to the Gentiles about how to behave towards the Jewish world. So it's a mirror reflection of that letter. Now there were Jews all over the Mediterranean world. We call them the diaspora, in English the dispersion. I'll tell you a little about that in a moment. Let me just finish off by telling you the later history of James because it's very moving. The more you know about a writer in the New Testament, the, the more you understand him. And you see, the Bible's a human book and I find most Christians just go for the divine side of it. But I find the human side is what makes it interesting and what makes it real. God has used very real people to communicate his word to us. Well, James stayed in Jerusalem and he got a nickname and they called him James the Just. What a beautiful nickname. James the Fair. Always get a fair judgment from that man. What a wonderful quality in a presiding elder. Happy are you if your church has a leader who is just and has no favourites and is fair with everybody. Isn't that beautiful? James the Just. And he also had a nickname, Oblias. Oblias. Do you know what the nickname means? It means a bulwark, a really reliable person, somebody who's really solid, somebody you can rely on. Now this all tells you the kind of man he was and just the kind of man to give us a bit of his wisdom because that's the kind of man who's lived it first. Came to a tragic end. Um, yet a wonderful one. Uh, let me tell you about it. The Roman governor, there were a lot of Roman governors after Pontius Pilate, and there was a gap between two of them. One left, a man called Festus, and before his uh, successor Albinus came, there was a gap of about two months when there was no Roman governor. And during that gap, the Jewish rulers really seized the opportunity to get some of these Christians. Because now, of course, there was no Roman governor to say you can't put anyone to death. Do you, do you follow? And in that two months gap, they got hold of James the Just, the presiding elder of the Jerusalem church. Do you know what they did? They took him up to the pinnacle of the temple and they said, now blaspheme Christ or we'll throw you off. 
the very pinnacle where the devil took Jesus. Remember? And they took him up there and said, now come on, blaspheme Christ. And you know what James had just said? He said, I see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of glory. So they threw him off. But it didn't kill him. So they started to stone him. Now remember what the devil said to Jesus on the pinnacle. You know, lest you dash your foot against a stone, angels will catch you. Well, the angels didn't catch James, and he was dashed down, broke a lot of bones, but he was still alive, so they stoned him, and he was still alive. And finally some, and as he lay there, with the stones, with his bones broken, and the stones being thrown at him, do you know what he said? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And the crowd watching cried out, James the just is praying for us. What an end. Finally someone, out of sheer mercy, got a big wooden club and dashed in and clubbed his head and he died. And that was how James came to an end. He was only one of many, of course, who uh, perished for Jesus in those early years. That was the end. When the Christians came after the crowd had dispersed to pick up his body and give it decent burial, they were astonished because for the first time they saw his knees and they record that it is, his knees were like camels, like camels' knees. Have you ever seen camels' knees? And they realized that this man had spent more time on his knees than on his feet. James the Just. He says quite a bit about prayer in this little letter. What a man. And we've got a letter from him. Well, I hope that's given you a, a feel for this man. What a privilege to have letters from people like this to guide us in our daily life. Well, now, now comes a bit of a problem. Uh, and the problem is that the style of the letter is so unlike a Galilean from up north. I mean, people despise those northerners from Nazareth, you know. They had a funny dialect for a start. You know, you what? <laughs> Thy speech betrayeth thee, they said to Peter, because they were up north and uh, they, were regarded, <laughs> they were regarded as illiterate, you know. And how come these uneducated men, men can talk like this? There's no doubt about it that when Jesus gets hold of a person, they become a gentleman. You know, they really do. But the Greek style in which he writes is very, very polished. And uh, this has created a bit of a problem. How did this uh, northerner from Nazareth get this incredible Greek style? And not just the language, but his, what we call his rhetoric or rhetoric. Never know which it's pronounced. But his style of speaking is amazing. He uses all the best devices of public speaking. And there are a number of such devices. Let me run through them. Rhetorical questions is one of them. That's when the speaker asks a question of the congregation but doesn't want an answer. Do you know what I mean? Like the famous case of a preacher, I think it was in the city temple, who said, you young men in the gallery, where would you rather be? In the light with the wise virgins or in the dark with the foolish ones? <laughs> See? Now, that's, that's called... That's called a rhetorical question. <laughs> Unfortunately, he got an answer and he got a unanimous answer from the gallery and it wasn't the one that helped his preaching, but never mind. You got the picture, a rhetorical question. Then we have paradoxical statements to gain attention. And if you make a startling statement that gets attention, like, count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into many trials. See? Joy, trials, so it gets attention. Imaginary conversations, and he uses this device. He kind of has a dialogue with somebody in the middle of it. And uh, when you do that, people are interested because people are always interested in overhearing conversations, and it gets them. A question to introduce a new subject, he uses that device. Uh, he has many imperatives. He he personifies things. He talks of sin as if it's uh, an animal. And he uses pictures and figures from everyday life. He talks about ships' rudders and forest fires and 
and bridles in horses and a farmer's life, all of which gets attention. He uses examples of famous men and women, Elijah, Abraham. He uses particularly the direct address, you, you, you. And all this is really remarkable. Public speaking. And uh, those who study public speaking, if they study James, they'd get a very good example of all the ways in which you can hold an audience's attention. Now, James, where did he get all this? Now, I think the answer lies in um, what we shall find with 1 Peter 2. And that is that many of the writers of the New Testament didn't actually write. They dictated or they spoke and someone else wrote. They used what we would call a shorthand typist or a secretary but was then called an amanuensis. What a ghastly word. Paul used Silas or Silvanus quite a lot and Peter used the same secretary actually, we shall find. And therefore, uh, the, the dictator would say, uh, now I want to tell them this, just put that into good shape, will you? As a boss might say to a secretary, um, now I want to just tell uh, this man this, this and this, would you just put that in the form of a good letter and, and then I'll sign it. You got the picture? So uh, that was frequently the way they did it and it looks as if James delivered all this verbally and got somebody to write it down for him and knock it into shape and send it off as a letter. That would explain a great deal both in this letter and in letters like 1 Peter, how a f Galilean fisherman could uh, write in such style. So that doesn't worry me at all, it just again makes it more human. James, I believe, would ask someone to come with him on some of his visits to the Jewish believers in the dispersion, say, now jot down what I tell them, knock it into shape and we'll send it out as a circular letter. That would explain all the problems, quote, that some of the scholars have. So we've got Greek rhetoric and Hebrew wisdom combined in this letter. Got someone who's really knocked it into the shape of a, a Greek address and yet basically it is Hebrew wisdom. Now we're getting very near the point where we can begin to get our teeth into the letter itself and look at the readers. It is not addressed to a church like many other letters or to a group of churches or to an individual. It's addressed to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations which makes it quite clear that it's addressed to the Jewish diaspora, the dispersion. And of course many of the first churches started among the dispersed Jews around the Mediterranean. When Paul went to a new place he always made for the synagogue and he always got his first converts out of the God-fearing people in the synagogue. And it, it, in a sense God had prepared for the Christian mission by the dispersion of the Jews. The Jews were dispersed twice once to Babylon in the exile as we call it but then before Jesus came they dispersed all over the Mediterranean world but for another reason. You know it says that in the fullness of time Jesus came. Do you know nothing could have been more better time than Jesus' arrival on earth because everything was ready. The Jews had been scattered around the Mediterranean, the Roman roads had been built and the Greek language was spoken everywhere. It was absolutely perfect for the rapid spread of the gospel. The roads were built, the language was universal and the Jews were everywhere who believed in God. So can't you see God preparing the whole situation? And those dispersed Jews were just ready to receive the news of the Messiah though some of them clearly were not. Incidentally, this tells you that there were no ten lost tribes. Have you heard the theory of the ten lost tribes? And Some people think Britain and America are the ten lost tribes. Don't believe a word of it. Those tribes have never been lost. God doesn't lose anybody. <laughs> he knows exactly where they are. And there were twelve tribes still in Jesus' day and uh, the twelve tribes were in the dispersion. If you ever meet a man called Levi or Cohen, they are the tribe, the priestly tribe. They're still around. So he writes to the twelve tribes in the dispersion 
around the Mediterranean world. And he needs to say something to them. Jewish believers at home in Jerusalem had a totally different situation to Jewish believers in the diaspora. With Jewish believers at home, their problem was that they were too isolated, too segregated, and became too strict as Christian believers. They were the legalisms, the legalists, the Judaizers, and their problem was pride. But out in the diaspora, the Jewish believers had a completely different problem, and the problem was assimilation. These people became too isolated and too strict and too legal. These people became too assimilated and too lax, and their problem was greed because most of them had gone there for business. You usually find Jews elsewhere than Israel for business. And uh, that's what took them there. That's what made them leave their Jewish homeland because there was a chance of making money somewhere else. That comes out very much in James. So you see, the Jew, Jewish believers at home – no, I'm sorry, that shouldn't be there – the Jewish believers at home were in the majority and it was a Jewish environment and therefore tended to be segregated, a kind of apartheid. The word Pharisee means separated one. And there was a real apartheid between Pharisees and sinners at home. Much too much legalism, much too much strictness, and much too much pride in self-righteousness. But the Jews in the dispersion were becoming too like the Gentiles. And it's still their problem, wherever the Jews live away from Israel, they become too assimilated, too much like the other people, and too greedy in business too hard in business, but too lax in their morals. Now it's this second group that James is writing to, and this will be the key that will unlock the letter for us. We'll pause there and have a break, and then we'll pick it up again in the next talk. <laughs>